the quality of peace that you give is like no other. And Lord, we celebrate you tonight. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. And if you're if you've come here tonight, I don't know what it is you came here tonight searching, seeking, trusting for. Someone came here tonight looking for strength, saying, Lord, I need strength. Strength, just give me strength to hold on. Just Help me, Father, to stand where you have asked me to stay. Someone else came here looking tonight for hope, that, Lord, there is a word you can speak that will ignite my faith and set my hope alight. He's here to meet with you tonight, and he will reach you right where you are. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for everyone gathered here in your presence to meet with you to receive a word, a word from your throne of grace. Touch every heart that's lifted up to you tonight. Fill us to overflowing. We lift up our hands in surrender. We reach out to you, Lord, like a child reaches out to their mother. Lift someone tonight. Do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Let your name be glorified. Let your power come to bear. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. Put your hands together. Celebrate the God of grace. And please go ahead and have your seat. It's a beautiful Wednesday in September, and we thank God for his grace. Um, let me take the opportunity to say a very big thank you to everyone who reached out to me on Monday, said a happy birthday, celebrated me. I, someone said a prayer for me on Monday, and I want to turn around and say that prayer for you. In the day of your manifestation your people will be there and they will celebrate you and they will honor you in Jesus' mighty name. You know, in the, it's, 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 a, it's a sad thing for you to be in your day of manifestation, in your day of celebration, there's no one there to celebrate with you and to say, Lord, see what mighty things you've done in his life, see what mighty things you've done in his life. In your day of celebration, your people will be there to celebrate with you. You will not be alone in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. We are in a new series in the month of September in our Mr. and Mrs. Better Half franchise. Our series in this year is Made in Heaven. But tonight we're doing something along the lines of dealing with negative emotions. And as I began to prepare tonight, um, God began to deal with my heart. And he said one reason why a lot of us um, find it very challenging to do away with negative emotions. We feel the weight and the burden of those negative emotions. We know ourselves that this, these emotions cannot take me far, but we feel handicapped in dealing with them. And he says one reason why a lot of us struggle in this area is because we have failed to really and truly le learn to love ourselves the way God loves us. Jesus was having a conversation with some Pharisees in the Bible days and the question came up that what is the greatest commandment and Jesus told them the greatest, the greatest is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. But the second is very similar, he said, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Very often we major on the first half of that second statement and ignore the second part. To love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I believe tonight that God wants to lead us into a deeper, a deeper understanding of what it truly means to love who you are and who you may, he made you to be. To look at yourself with the same eyes, through the same eyes that he looks at us with because God doesn't put together rubbish. Amen? Amen. I think that's a big step for many people in their journey with God to recognize that what God puts together this enterprise and this entity that he put together was beautifully and wonderfully put together. And you were put together by design on purpose for purpose. And all that he has put on your inside, I pray that it will come into manifestation. You will see it, you will recognize it, and you will embrace it in the name of Jesus. Philemon 1 6 says that the communication of your faith is effectual by the acknowledgement of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. There's a level of manifestation, there's a degree 
of manifestation that can only come in your life when you begin to see the good things, the beautiful things, the wonderful things that God has made on deposit inside of you. So can you say with me tonight, I love me. Believe me, it's not a sin. I can assure you, it is not a sin. God wants you to love you. Can you say that again with me tonight? I love me. And I will love you, my neighbor. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Tonight we're dealing with the topic, dealing with negative emotions. And I'd like us very quickly to open to the book of Numbers, chapter 20, from verse 7. We're going to read a few verses from the book of Numbers, chapter 20, and verse 7. Do we have it up on the screen? Okay, if you have your Bibles open to Numbers chapter 20 from verse 7. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. Now this portion of scripture is um, happening in a time in Israel where they have left um, the nation of Egypt. They've left Egypt, they've crossed the Red Sea, and they are in the wilderness, making their way to the promised land, the land that God had promised them. God promised them that I will take you to a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of promise, a land of infinite possibilities. And along the journey, we know that there were times and seasons where there was they had reason, to, they, they felt they had reason. Israel felt they had reason to complain and to murmur against God. In this place, there was um, a search for water. And Moses had, at one point in time, struck a rock so that water would flow for the children of Israel. And they came to this second place in their journey where they needed water. But it's interesting that God spoke to Moses a different command from the first command he had given them the first time they were looking for water. Then he said, strike the rock. This time he told Moses, speak to the rock. Amen? So God told Moses, take your rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation, but speak to the rock. All right? In verse 9, so Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? And you can almost hear the anger in Moses' voice as he spoke to the children of Israel. From verse 11, it says, Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Now, this portion of scripture is very, it's a very good place for us to start tonight because it describes a situation where Moses was angry, livid with the children of Israel. He was, you could feel the angry emotions just rising off of him. And where God had given him a specific command to speak to the rock, he makes a mistake and strikes the rock. There's something about emotions, not inability to correctly manage and channel our emotions that put us in extreme danger. And we'll see that from verse 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, and this was God's, um, this was God speaking here. Because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hallowed among them. It's interesting that verse 13 says that the children of Israel contended with the Lord. And he spoke a command to all of them, including their leader Moses, who the Bible describes as the meekest man on earth. Who the Bible describes as having seen God, at least seen God's backside. Who the Bible describes as having spent 40 nights on a mountaintop just communing with God and his face beginning to shine and just enjoying the presence of God. A man who understood the voice of God and understood what God's command was. 
It's amazing for me that he could have missed it in this moment on account of his anger in that moment. God will help us to manage our emotions and to steward our emotions correctly. I was reading a book earlier this week, The 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth by John Maxwell. And he made this statement um, in the book. He said, good management of bad experiences leads to great growth. Can you say that with me tonight? Good management of bad experiences leads to great growth. Now, the Bible doesn't promise us. It's interesting that when Jesus was leaving, he didn't say that now that you're born again, disciples, now that you know me, you will live a life full of joy and no sorrow and no pain. He didn't. In fact, he promised us that in this world, you will go through some things, but have no fear. Be of good cheer, he said. I have overcome. So one thing we can be guaranteed of is that there will not always be perfect circumstances. There will not always be perfect scenarios. But God expects us to steward our emotions. Amen. Regardless of what we're going through and what we're dealing with. Amen. The Bible says as well that Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. Psalm 147 says Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Where, does these, where do these emotions come from? These emotions that settle in our hearts and make it so difficult for us to make the right judgment call from time to time. They're from our experiences, the things we go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Amen. But Jesus said, that he is a rebuilder. Amen. And the rebuilder is in the house tonight. He will rebuild and he will restore. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So I want to ask tonight, what is the condition of your heart? From time to time, a lot of us will go to the hospital and get a medical checkup. Just checking to see how our organs, our physical organs, our bodies are functioning. But how often do we take the time to just check the condition of our hearts? The Bible says that out of the heart flow the issues of life. So it is critical and crucial for us to continually maintain a state of health in our hearts. I have two daughters, as many of us know, and I remember this one occasion where um, they're at the age now where they can do kitchen chores and, you know, function, do things for themselves in the kitchen. So on this one day they were doing something in the kitchen, I think cutting an orange or something, I don't recall exactly what. And then one of them takes the knife and was using it and then remembers something she wanted to do, drops the knife and hurries off, planning to come back and continue with what she was doing. And her sister comes and sees this knife lying fallow and picks it up and begins to use it to do something else. At this point, the older sister comes and says, oh, why did you take my knife? And she's like, no, it's not your knife, it's everybody's knife and I'm using it. And an argument ensues, and my beautiful, wonderful girls decide that the best thing to do at that point in time was to struggle over a knife. Some of you already know how this story is going to end. Yes, there was blood. The next thing I hear is a scream coming from the kitchen. I run down, and I see them in blood. Someone has a very deep cut. I one look at it, and I see all the bleeding, and I know this is not a question of GV and cutting wool in our house. We bundled ourselves up and rushed off to the hospital. You know, and we get to the hospital and the emergency, of course, takes one look at the wound and says, I'm sorry, madam, we're going to need to stitch this wound. Now, unfortunately for my daughter, she is the one of the two of them who is so scared of needles. When I was growing up, I'm the daughter of a military man, father, and a nurse. I would prefer to take injection than tablets, swallow tablets. Give me injection any day, rather than the choice of using tablets. So I'm completely flustered and I cannot understand how you can be so afraid of needles, you know. So I'm watching this girl and she begins her theatrics in the hospital. You know, and it's amazing. I remember listening to these uh, men explaining to her, we need to give you an injection at the site so that it won't hurt you when we're stitching. But she was so overwhelmed by the thought of a needle and injection that she just continues to make a fuss and make all of this noise. And you know, many of us, when we see the condition of our hearts, the woundedness of our hearts, the situation it, that, we, that we're carrying on our inside, 
rather than exposing the wound to God and saying, yes, Lord, touch this, heal this, make it clean, make it new. We're rather struggling with our healer. Struggling with the solutions he brings to bring healing to our heart's condition. And I recognize tonight that we've been through all kinds of situations, all kinds of experiences in our lives. Some that felt like a knife wound into our very soul and into our very spirit. But you see, Jesus is able to perform the surgery and he can go deeper than any physical knife can go. And until we are willing to submit ourselves to the healer's touch, he's not able to get in there and perform the surgery that needs to be done. This will be a night of healing for you in the name of Jesus. One thing I wanted to emphasize is that not every wound can be treated with cotton wool and a bandage. Some wounds will need local anesthesia. Amen? Some wounds will need general anesthesia. Amen? And it is the same way with us in our spirit. I mean, some of us are dealing with the burden of an offense that we've struggled with for, for seasons and seasons. And every time we say, look, I'm forgiven, I'm ready to move on, something just brings it again to our memory. And just, it seems like two steps forward and then four steps back. And you're like, when will I ever be free of this emotion? You know, sometimes I realize that when I begin to feel that way, when I feel like I'm struggling with an offense that I feel like I should be able to let this go so easily, I stop and ask myself a question. Have I truly submitted myself to the healer's touch? Or am I just enjoying that sensation of feeling like I'm the one who has been wronged? You know, sometimes that physical, that actual action or activity of saying, you know what, I let it go, I submit it, I leave it. It removes from you the ability to go back and keep massaging it and reminding yourself of how righteous you were in that situation. Isn't it? I remember this one season, not, not too long in our marriage, my husband and I had this fight early one morning. I was on my way to work and we just had this argument. I thought what I thought was a senseless argument. And as usual, neither, but no, neither person was willing to back off and apologize. So I leave the house in this puff of anger, get in my car and I begin to drive off. And I'm just crying in the car and telling God, you know, God, I've been telling you, I've been telling you that this man, you need to talk to him. You need to tell him how very, how very unreasonable he is sometimes. And I was just going off and going off and ranting, God, things need to change. Things cannot continue like this in this marriage. I promised you that this was forever, but you need to intervene now. And he allowed me, as the Holy Spirit would typically do, allowed me to say my own finish. And then I heard this whisper in my heart. I agree with you. Things cannot continue like this. I need you to begin to treat him as though he has never offended you before. And you know, I understood the gravity of that statement. I knew it wasn't just one of those, you know, we're just, me and the Holy Spirit, just gisting in the morning and we're enjoying quiet time and it's sweet. I knew this was, this was something different. He said, I want you to go home today and treat him as though there has never been an offense. You see, that's one that you like to keep reminding me of. He did this, he did that. Because of that, Lord, um, I, need, I need you to go back home and completely wipe the slate clean. Ha. Huh. All the way to work that morning, I thought about all the... I understood what the Holy Spirit was telling me. He said, you are giving up your rights to continue to play that same tape. You know that tape now? That tape that we continually play. And you, can you imagine how he... How, why could he have said that? It's I, I know it's because I'm quiet. I know that is why he likes to take advantage of me. I knew I was giving up the right to continue to play that same CD again and again. You know how it is when your CD has scratched and it keeps coming back? Again and again, I, I understood what the Holy Spirit was saying. And all the way to work that day, I had a good cry. And I just kind of let it out of my heart. And that marked, I can, I can testify tonight, that that marked a turning point for me in my marriage. Because as I gave myself to do the things that God told me to do, I began to see healing. The things that I thought... Okay, Lord, okay, so if I, sub, if I submit 
to this scalpel? Won't, it feel, won't he feel like he has even more opportunity to take advantage of me? The very things I was scared of, he completely took them and he healed them. Was it easy? Absolutely not. Just like with every surgery, you're submitting yourself to the scalpel, the surgeon's knife. But if you will submit to it, there is healing ahead. Amen. Someone say that with me tonight. There is healing off the road. Amen. 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 So the question tonight is, do you want to be well? Do you want to be well? And it's not, I understand that it's not the kind of question that you just shout out tonight. Um, John Maxwell tells this story that he says his father liked this um, parable that his father liked to ask. He said there were five frogs sitting on a piece of wood and four of those frogs decided to jump off. How many frogs were left on the piece of wood? How many? One, right? That was my response too when I first read it. But he said, no, five. Deciding to jump off the rock is different from actually jumping off the rock. So do you want to be made well tonight? It will involve some action. Someone say that with me tonight. It will involve some action. Amen. It will, be, it will involve making new habits. Deciding to do things differently. Amen. Amen. The Lord will provide strength and grace to do all that we need to do tonight for healing and health. So very quickly, I want to deal tonight with four enemies of the human heart. Four enemies of the human heart. Um, these four enemies of the human heart have the capacity and the ability to poison our hearts and keep us from moving in the direction of wholeness and healing, which is why we're going to deal with them tonight and we're going to set ourselves up to follow the path of healing and health. So four enemies of the human heart. The first is anger. The Bible describes, that, uh, describes anger as resting in the bosom of a fool. I had a friend many years ago in, um, the, in the office where I worked who said that when she first got married, I mean, it was normal for them every morning. Somebody is calling their parents. I'm not doing it again. I'm not doing it again. This is it. I'm not doing it again. And in all truth, I mean, she was very upfront about the fact that, look, I'm, I'm a very volatile person. I know. In, when she got married, she had to learn to deliberately submit that volatility to Jesus. Because she said she used to tell herself every morning. It was part of her morning charge. The way you have a closing charge. It was her morning charge every day. Anger rests in the bosom of a fool. I am not a fool. Anger will not rest in my heart. You know, but I was sharing with some ladies last week about um, this subject of anger. I remember one of them mentioned the fact that actually the key word, the key word in that verse of scripture is rest. For anger to rest in your heart, that means what? <laughs> anger comes into the heart and just simply chills. Thank you, that's the word, chills. The Bible says be angry and sin not. So being angry at a situation is not the problem. It's how much room and space we give anger. How much time we allow the anger to just sit and rest and enjoy itself. Someone needs to give anger a red card tonight. And say as much as I, 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 I don't like this situation, I refuse to let you take a board in my heart. I refuse to give you tenancy in my heart. The room in my heart is too expensive. I cannot give out it out for free. I'm sorry. Anger, it's time to leave. Quit notice in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, a fleeting or visiting anger won't, you know, won't do you in. Okay? But it's when anger overstays its welcome. That's when it becomes a problem. And Jesus told, Jesus kind of gave us an answer to that, that issue of anger. You know, anger, the, that feeling of anger comes from the place where you feel that someone owes you something. I mean, am I right? It feels like a debt that someone owes you, debt, D-E-B-T. Someone made a withdrawal, a forcible withdrawal from your emotional account. 
and you feel like they owe you something. That's, I mean, that is the feeling that anger kind of feeds on. The feeling of being owed. The feeling that this person should compensate me for something that they did. And that's why forgiveness is the answer to that heart condition of anger. And Jesus told a story in Matthew 18, a parable about two men. One of them owed his master, the king, a hundred thousand um, talents, I think, a hundred thousand talents. And he couldn't pay. The Bible describes in Matthew 18 that he couldn't pay. He didn't have the capacity or the capability to pay. And he goes to his master and he begs, please, 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 I'm very sorry. Please give me time. And his master says, okay, you know what? I forgive you. I cancel the debt. You're free. Go. And then he walks out from his master's presence and finds another one of his colleagues who owes him a hundred denarii. Now I went to check on Google the difference between the denarii and the talent. And it says that it's almost a thousand times a talent. One talent is almost a thousand times a denarii. So imagine that he owed his master 10,000 thousand denarii. And he had just been forgiven for owing 10 million denarii. And he sees this guy who owes him 100 denarii. And he goes ballistic. You must pay me, you must pay me. You must pay me, you must pay me. And it says that he grabbed him and put him in the prison. And until he pays everything, I'm not going to let him go. And he thinks all is well. But the Bible describes that there were other servants who saw what happened and thought this is not right. This is not right. And they run back to the master and tell the master that, look, see this man that you forgave just now. See, see what he has done. And the master was so angry and upset with him. And he calls him back and says, didn't I just forgive you? And you couldn't turn around and do the same to your guy. Okay, you know what's going to happen? You are going to pay back. And you know, I read this story and it just hit me all over again. That many of those times where we feel like we're struggling with an offense that we can't let go of, we say, okay, God, I forgive, I give you, I, I, I let it go. I leave it in your presence. And then we walk right out from there and we feel like, ah, I see this person's face, I've seen this person's face, oh, and I'm angry again. I, I, I just can't get past it. And it hit me that that's exactly what we're doing right there, right there, right there. We get into God's presence and because of the strength of what Jesus has done for us, healing us, delivering us, saving us, cleansing us, forgiving us all our own sins and iniquities. And on the strength of that, we say, Lord, I give it to you. And we walk out right from there and we see someone like us who we should be able to turn around and use that same grace that we have received from God and just let them go and we just hold on to them in anger. And the warning I heard in my heart was, Refusing to forgive and let go is its own prison. It creates its own prison. Amen. It's a dangerous place to be. It's a dangerous place to go. Amen. An angry and unforgiving heart is its own prison. Amen. You will not be in prison in Jesus' mighty name. We will see the true value of the forgiveness that Jesus has freely given us. And we will extend it. Now, I say this often, and I was tempted not to bring it into this discussion again tonight, but just, just for the sake of that one person who may not have heard me say it before. When I'm dealing with a particularly difficult offense, I mean, it's so difficult. I remember one day early this year, I was dealing with a particular offense, and I was so sure I had let go. I was so sure that, ah, God, I'm above this one now. I mean, this one, I've dealt with bigger offenses than this. Let it, you know. But I wake up that morning, and I, I knew that I was still angry and bitter at this person. And I just couldn't pray. I, I knew I was struggling to let it go. And I just realized what the problem was right there. I hadn't prayed for them. You see, it's worked for me so often that I can turn around and I can hand it to you as a veritable weapon, a tool if you learn to pray for the people who abuse you and despitefully use you, just like Jesus said, you will break the chain of that bondage. That, that, that chain of bondage that seems to hold us down to that offense, that won't let us move beyond that place. If you will pray for them from your heart. And I'm not saying the kind of prayers that, you know, some of our friends like to pray. 
thunder fire you. Not those kind of prayers. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of prayers where you're telling God prosper them, bless them. The generations coming after them will be blessed. Whatever it is that they need in this season, Lord, supply it to them. And depending on how deep the offense is, the first few times you pray this prayer and try to pray it from your heart, you will cry. I can promise you. Because you will be struggling in your heart with that feeling of, ah, is that what I should be saying about this person right now? But I can promise you, I can promise you, as the Lord liveth, if you will stay with it, and if you will continue in it, you will wake up one morning and you will just begin to prophesy from your heart concerning this person. And then you know, yes, the chains are broken and I am free. And the sting of that offense will lose its hold over you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So we've dealt with anger. The second enemy of the heart I want us to deal with tonight is guilt. Guilt. With anger, we said, anger stems from a place where you feel that someone owes you a debt. Right? Guilt stems from the place where you feel you owe a debt. Right? You feel that you owe a debt that possibly can never be repaid. What I've done is too bad. People should not even hear it. You just want to hide it away from everyone and anyone. And the problem with carrying this enemy of the heart is low self-esteem, the failure and the ability to really grasp and receive the love of God rides on the back of this guilty feeling. Amen. The truth is that we all owe the debt, all of us. The Bible describes that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But thank God for the gift of salvation. And at some point in your life, you're going to need to either believe it or not. Either believe it that the blood of Jesus has the ability, has the capacity, has the potency, has the power to heal, deliver, save, cleanse completely from every manner of iniquity and choose to walk free. Amen. Amen. Um, it's important in dealing with guilt sometimes to ask yourself the question, what, what more could God be asking of me in this situation? So I heard a story about a man of God who said when he was a teenager, he and his friends, um, he and his friends, I don't remember exactly how it went, he and his friends either destroyed this man's front yard, the front yard of his house. And they, they, think, they seemed to have gotten away with it. Nobody saw them, nobody caught them. And for many years after, he had confessed it to God, he had told God, you know, I'm sorry, I don't know what was wrong with me. But he just, every time he, every now and again, he would just hear a word in his heart, God saying, this, this thing, this thing, there's, there's something here that hasn't been finished. And after a few years of carrying that guilt, he had the presence of mind to stop and ask, okay, so God, what do you want me to do? And God told him, I want you to go back to that man and tell him what you did when you were a teenager and ask him to forgive you. Now, let me make it clear. At this point, he was already serving as a youth pastor in his church. And he knew someone else had been blamed for that offense and probably had been punished for that offense. So for him, he had to think that, oh, but God, can you really be asking me to go and do this? If I go back, then I'm admitting to the fact that I was quietly watching while someone else took the blame. But he knew, what, he knew that God had spoken to him. So eventually he picked up his courage, and walked up to this man's house, knocked on the door, went in, and confessed his crime. And he said the man forgave him, they prayed about it, they prayed together, and he said as he was walking out of that man's house, he finally got it. That there will be seasons, there will be, there'll be some offenses that you will need to take the courage to go back to the offended party and tell them, I am sorry for what I did. I did this, and I'm sorry for what I did. How can I make it better? I think the problem a lot of us have with that subject of apology is that we think apology, every apology is the admission of guilt. Now, some apologies, when you are the guilty party, is absolutely required. 
But sometimes, how do you deal with it when you know someone is offended at you for something that you possibly didn't do? Has anyone ever been there before? You know someone is offended at you or upset with you for something that you just really don't feel, you just really don't feel like you were at fault. Why should I say sorry? I hear that all the time. I, I mean, it was my constant mantra in my own, in my house for many years. Why should I say sorry? I, don't, I didn't do anything wrong. He should apologize to me. But I came across a book some years ago, The Five Languages of Apology, written by um, the same franchise owners of The Five Love Languages, um, Gary Chapman, thank you. And that book completely changed my life. An apology isn't always an admission of guilt. Sometimes an apology is necessary just because you value the relationship and you understand that it is it is one of the weapons in your arsenal for managing conflict. You recognize that your brother, your sister is offended and in deep pain, and you are willing to swallow your pride, swallow your own sense of rights, and sit with them and say, you know what? I'm sorry that our relationship has degenerated to this level. What can we do to make it better? Amen. Amen. Apology. If you're dealing with a burden of guilt, it is important to confess it first of all to God, amen, and receive the forgiveness that God gives you. But if you're still dealing with a burden of guilt, it may be necessary to ask God, what more do you want me to do in this situation? There may be some restitution he may be leading you to do in that situation, amen? Amen, amen, amen. The next enemy of the heart is envy. Envy. James chapter 3 and verse 16. Okay, that was very loud. Amen. James chapter 3 and verse 16. Do we have it? James, James, James. Okay, there we are. James chapter 3. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now we mentioned anger. Anger is um, an enemy of the heart that rests on the assumption that someone owes me. We dealt with guilt that rests on the assumption that I owe a debt. Envy, on the other hand, rests on the assumption that God is the culprit. How come everybody else has been blessed? How come this person is better, this person is brighter, this person is more beautiful, this person is more gifted than me? Why should they be smarter than me? Why should they have it better than me? Why should they have an easier life, supposedly, because what we see sometimes doesn't always represent the full picture, does it? Amen. God is the culprit in an envious heart because the envious heart believes that they deserve all the blessings and all the giftings rather than some other person or what some other people have. And what do you do with an envious heart? The envious heart assumes or sees nothing good within themselves, nothing worthy of praise, nothing worthy of celebration. And how do you combat an envious heart? Psalm 103 describes a conversation that the psalmist was having with himself. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. An envious heart is quick to forget God's goodness, God's mercy, God's grace, because it is easier to see the problems than it is to see the blessings. Amen. How many of us agree that it's easier to see what is not working in our lives sometimes than to stop and acknowledge what is working in our lives? And when we will stop and be very deliberate to say, you know what, God, I'm counting my blessings. I'm counting it all joy. Even though I'm going through diverse temptations, even though I'm going through diverse, diverse trials, I know that the trying of my faith is working something out in me. And I choose to give you thanks in spite of what I'm going through. Amen. Amen. Um, 
it's important, it is vitally important to give thanks, to enumerate and capture all the things that seem ordinary sometimes, but when we stop to really evaluate the grace and the goodness of God, we realize that it actually amounts to a whole lot. Amen. Amen. The last enemy of the heart we'll deal with tonight is greed. Proverbs 11 and verse 24 describes that there is one who scatters. Amen. There is one who scatters yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right and it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich and he who waters will also be watered himself. Now the greedy heart works on the assumption that um, everybody, in fact, I owe myself in every situation. Everybody else has to take a back seat and a lower seat to me because I owe it to myself to take, 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 grab, 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 have, 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 build, 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 and amass more. You heard the popular saying that says, um, get all you can, can all you can get, and then you sit on the can. That is the mantra of the greedy heart. Amen. And how do you combat greed in your heart? It's by being generous. It's by being generous and giving from your heart, being willing to be poured out and to be poured out fully and just to, be, to live a life that is completely given to God. I remember a conversation I had with God. I think I was still in university at the time. I don't remember exactly when, but I think it was in university. And I was just having a conversation around the fact that, I mean, God, there are some dangerous levels that people get to with you. You know, there, there are people who have walked with you and experienced you in deep dimensions. How does one get to that level? How does one enter into those places? And then just the way usually is when you ask God a question, usually he answers you with a deeper question. And he asks, Did you, do you really want to go into deep levels with me? And he reminded me about a book that I had recently read. Um, it's Mover of Men and Mountains, R.G. Letourneau. He was an American industrialist. He built all kinds of earth-moving equipment. And from his story in the book, he would just go to sleep at night thinking, okay, Lord, we need, I need a new technology that can move, you know, this kind of equipment, do this kind of work, this kind of build. And he would just be sleeping at night and in his dreams, God would literally show him, show him all kinds of designs and he'd get up immediately, get a pencil and quickly draw it and send it to his engineering team and all kinds of patents. He was... God showed him deep things, new things, great and mighty things. But the story didn't start there. He lived a life that was committed 100% to God. He started out tithing at 10%, but he gradually lived, I think he gradually got to 95%, if I'm correct. He lived on 5% of his income and gave 95% to God. That, that was the level of sacrifice and generosity he chose to walk with God in. And God asked me, okay, you want to get into deep levels, right? Deep levels. Oh yeah, now let's talk. <laughs> let's talk. It's within your grasp. It's within your, it's within your capacity. One thing, one thing I can say for sure and say for certain is in my walk with God and in my walk with, in learning to live a life that was 100% given to God. I've never seen him go back on his word. And he has taken me from one depth to another depth. From the levels of giving your month, one month salary, your income for a month, and just wondering, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to survive. Lord, just help me. I don't know how it's going to happen. And he just shows up for me here, there. I remember sitting with a young woman right there after one service and I was counseling with her about something. And I don't know how it wove its way into the conversation. And I told her, you know what, there's nothing I'm wearing tonight that, I, that my one shishi is not inside it. Sorry, one shishi for the people watching us via the internet. That means I don't have any of my personal money, amen, in it. God just 
miraculously sought me out. Sometimes I'm overwhelmed. I just sit and I'm like, God, this is, this is, I mean, I, I don't even know how to, to begin to capture the depths. My first um, salary when I got into um, bank, so I served with the bank and then I went to work in a newspaper company, decided that, oh, this wasn't for me. And I began to trust God again to um, change jobs. And eventually, it's a long story, eventually I got this job, this new job in this new organization. I was very excited because I'd been owed salaries in the previous company I'd been in. So I was really ready for a new level. And I got my letter, was so excited. Thank God I was rejoicing and God just whispered into my heart, um, the first three months on that job, you're going to give me your salary. And I knew already that I didn't even have the means at that point in time to sustain myself for those three months. But I just cast in my mind back to the depths of what he had done with me, of how we had walked together and made it work with or without a cloud in the sky. I mean, words would fail me to describe how I have seen God come through for me simply because I chose to give up my substance and give it into his hands and trust that he owes no man and trust that he said me, I, I, if you lend to the, to the poor, if you give to the poor, you are lending to me, I will repay. To know and believe that he said that, bring your tithe into my storehouse. Ha. Try me. He said, try me. Just try me. Amen. Amen. There's something about greed in the human heart that is toxic. Amen. And there's a parable Jesus told about a young man who, a rich young man, he said, who is ground brought forth plentifully and he thought to ask himself so what am i going to do ah, things are really working for me i have i have done well this year i'm going to tear down the bands i have i'm going to build bigger bands i mean he made all these plans this is what i'm going to do and he said god came to him that night and said your soul will be required and then we will see whose it is all these things that you have laid up for you but the clincher for me in that scripture is, he said, such is it with everyone who is not rich towards God. Amen. If you want to break the backbone of that toxicity of the heart that is called greed, only a generous spirit, a generous heart can deal a blow. Amen. So we've dealt with four conditions of the heart tonight. We've talked about anger. We've talked about guilt. We've talked about greed. We've talked about envy. We've said in order to break your way out of, this, of these heart conditions, you need to learn to forgive. You need to learn to confess your faults, both to God and to one another. We've said you need to learn to be generous and have a generous spirit and to be thankful in all situations. And I just wanted to throw it out into the house tonight. Like whatever the status of your heart, whatever the condition of your heart, Jesus came to bind, the, to, to, to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up their wounds. There is a balm in Gilead. That is the good news. That is the good news. Jesus came to deliver. He came to save. He came because he wanted us to have life and life more abundantly. He didn't want us to be satisfied with a weak, mediocre quality of life. He came to give us a quality of life that would lift us above whatever, whatever, whatever this world has to offer. So I just want us for a moment tonight to just, just begin to ask God tonight, whatever it is, if if you're dealing with a, a, a forgiveness issue and that has just been a burden for you for a long time, you've, you've just assumed that, look, look, I can't even get over it. You know, it's one of those things that will just pack aside and deal with other issues in life. I want you to lift it up to the Lord tonight. Lift it up to the Lord tonight. Lift it up to the Lord tonight. And ask God.
to heal. Ask him to touch. Ask him to save. Ask him to deliver.